Welcome to the Odyssey Podcasts. This is Jean Cavellos, Director of Odyssey. Odyssey is an intensive six-week workshop for writers of fantasy, science fiction, and horror whose work is approaching publication quality. Odyssey is held each summer on the campus of St. Anselm College in Manchester, New Hampshire. Adult writers from all over the world apply. Only 16 are admitted. Top authors, editors, and agents serve as guest lecturers. For more information, visit www.odysseyworkshop.org. Podcast number six is an excerpt from a lecture Terry Bisson gave at Odyssey in the summer of 1999 on setting. The text of this recording is copyright 1999 by Terry Bisson. The sound recording is copyright 2007 by Odyssey Writing Workshops. Well, it's always, a, as Gene can tell you, it's always a little artificial to separate the elements of a short story because the whole point of a short story is to pull these elements into a kind of a seamless whole to where they are, they're not separate because character is really determined by setting and setting is really determined by character and plot is character. These are they're artificial distinctions. It's a little like we were talking last night about the distinction between fantasy and science fiction. You sort of know what it is, but to actually define it and distinguish it would be a uh, it's sort of a it's sort of an academic and a scholastic and a sort of pointless enterprise. It's kind of the same way with <laughs> setting, except that setting, setting, character, plot, all these kind of things. If you spend all your time trying to figure out which is which and which is most important and which is primary and everything, it's kind of a waste of time because what you're really supposed to do as a cook is to put the whole thing together, heat it up, and make it one thing. And so uh, with that understanding that we're not talking about something actually that's different from the idea of a story, the, um, the characters, the the plot or anything else. I think we can talk about the setting in a, in a sort of a productive way. And the setting of a story is in the, the kind of the most obvious sense. It's where, where and when the story is. It's, the setting is never just place. It's also time, a, a place at a certain period. The setting is also, in a sense, uh, essential to the beginning of the story. And that's sort of where I get on familiar ground because when I talk about science fiction in particular and short fiction in general, I always begin with the beginning, which seemed kind of logical to me. It seemed kind of the easiest way to do it. And the, the beginning in a number of senses, though, to me, one of the things, that looking in your all stories and looking in stories in general, is one of the first things is to learn where, the, where a story starts. The opening of a story, it's like, I look at it as the point of access. It's like a door, it's, it's where the door opens and what's the first thing you see when you open the, the door into a story? What's your point of access? This is the, to me, one of the singular and critical points for a writer that a writer has in his or her control is, it's like when a, the curtain goes up on a play or the first shot in a movie. The first thing people see is not the most important, but the determining and critical thing. It, it determines how you react to everything else. The setting is key to this. You open the door, what do you see? You see a room, do you see a, an ocean, do you see outer space, do you see a bunch of cowboys running around, you know, in that case you have a western. You see a rocket ship or a robot, we're in familiar territory. So. The setting to me does four, it's the point of access, which I'm going to come back to. But the setting has four, to me, four, four functions. And I'm just making this up, so you guys can, uh, can delete or add as we go. One of them is uh, what John Gardner calls verisimilitude. Do, are people familiar with Gardner's book, The Art of Fiction? Yeah, John Gardner. One of the points that he makes, he talks about fiction as the creation of what he calls a fictional dream. And to me it's the most, it's kind of the most productive and the most, um, productive is a good word, um, way of 
looking at what a writer is trying to do and what a reader is trying to get out of a story. Narrative works, to me, in a peculiar way on the human man, where you are actually in a story. And this uh, people know this. This is not some new insight that I developed. But if you think about it, it's, it's really kind of a, an unusual uh, attribute of the hominid man, where we can actually, in, in hearing somebody tell a narrative, in watching a movie, or something like this, we actually transport ourselves into this narrative. We walk down that street. We open that door. We slug that guy. And fiction goes in and out of this dream. And the primary constraint that you have as writers is to keep that dream intact, to keep the elephants in the tent, to keep the crowd quiet and the lights on, and to keep the show going. And you can interrupt the show, you can speed the show up, you can slow it down, but the show, the dream, the illusion that you create is really what you're doing. That's the primary thing. And that illusion has to be in a place. It has to have verisimilitude, as uh, Gardner calls it, which is a long word, but kind of a, it's fun to say. Uh, and ver by verisimilitude, by verisimilitude you mean the writer, the ringmaster's ability to convince you that all this bullshit he's throwing at you actually either happened or could happen or might happen, or you're willing to believe it happened. So this, again, this is not some new insight, but it's the it's what you call the suspension of disbelief, or Gardner calls actually the creation of belief. Unless you have a setting, unless you have a real place, unless it's a real place flushed out with detail, with wind, with weather, with smells, with sounds, it's not going to be real. People are not going to believe it. It's going to be an outline, it's going to be a treatment, it's going to be an idea for a story. It becomes a story when it has reality. and. The setting is not the only way that reality is created, but it's one of the first ways. It's one of the first places it comes from. The verisimilitude is in how you treat the setting, if you, that, how you treat the, the spaces, the smells, the light, and all that kind of stuff. That's one aspect of, and like I say, setting, all setting will give you a story. Won't give you a story, just give you the setting for the story. You still gotta put a story in it. The second thing I think it does the setting also sometimes is of interest in itself. It is sometimes what the story's about. This is true in um, like a travel story or a story set in, um, say, New Orleans during the Mardi Gras, or a story set on the planet Mars, or set on the floor of the ocean, or, you know, I can think of a thousand places where I'd like to read a story about because I'm interested in the place. So, um, how many people read uh, In the Thin Air, the Crack Era book? Okay. It's set, you know, on the top 10,000 feet of Mount Everest. That's the setting. It's interesting in itself. It gets even more interesting when the people start to fall off. But, um, <laughs> you know, the setting itself actually works. So, a lot of times the setting is just, it, it's either what the story is about or it's, it's what the story is really about while the story pretends to be about something else. It may be a story about a father and son bonding on a ship as they go around Cape Horn, but really the father and son bonding might just be a little device to give you an excuse to get on a, a ship going around Cape Horn. And the setting is about what it's really about. The third thing that setting is about is that it often resonates with the story itself. Not directly, not like, not in the sense that, in say the crack era, which is not a story, but let's let that pass, where the, where the, the actual action is called into place by the setting, but in a way in which the setting is, forms a metaphor for the action, or a metaphor for what takes place. Now that would be, for example, look at The Wizard of Oz, where the setting is the flat plains of Kansas are also a metaphor for the grayness of her. I mean, this is all pretty obvious stuff, but, you know, it's black and white. You get to Oz, it's in color. It's the, the setting there is sort of a metaphor for, you know, the drabness, the emptiness, and so forth of life. So that's a way in which setting kind of, it kind of resonates with the, either the character or the theme or the, 
the plot or something of the story. It's in a, in a way I'd call it a metaphor. Where the, where the setting is like a metaphor, and it's not the the and the the setting is kind of a. It's a kind of an externalization of what's going on in the story. It's another way of, it's a repeat, it's a resonance, it's a metaphor. All right, the fourth one is the setting can be used as an excuse for a lot of pretty talk. You can have pages of words about how beautiful Istanbul is in the sunset or how exciting it is to look at New York from the top of the Empire State Building. The setting often becomes the sort of vehicle for beautiful writing. In that case, you want to get rid of it. <laughs> As Samuel Johnson once said, I'm sure people have heard this, that the way, to, the way a writer should edit or um, sort of go back through the la uh, their own work is you should read it through when you're finished with it, and you should read it through, and if there's something in it you find is particularly wonderful, you should cross it out. <laughs> I'm an enemy of pretty talk, I think, and most writers are. I mean, the idea of using the setting or characters or anything else as a, as a vehicle in which, for which to show your, your powers over the English language or your ability to write fancy prose is not a functional way to use uh, setting or character or anything else. So I just threw that in as kind of a joke. But I think these three are kind of what we're talking about when we talk about setting. Now, I wanted to move from that into the idea of the opening of a story, uh, the sort of opening of the door, the point of access into a story. And this is, um, this is the point at which the author uses the setting, the characters, the language, to give the first tiniest bit of information about the story that will set the tone for how the reader reacts to the rest of the story. The opening of a story is where you exercise the most control you're going to have over the reader. It's when the reader comes with no preconceptions, they start the story, you're, you're basically setting the tone for the whole encounter, the encounter being the story. And so you what, you, what you're going to do is announce what the setting is, usually, announce something about the characters, and uh, you're going to announce something about the tone and the genre of the story. The point being that, that that's the point at which you're most in control, the reader is the most open to you sort of starting the show. The setting has to be, has to have a lot of detail. That's the other thing I want, is you can't just say that you're becalmed in the Sargasso Sea. You just can't just, you know, you have to walk to the edge of the boat. You gotta look down in the water. You gotta smell seaweed. You gotta feel the boat rock. That, I mean, the setting is really not just something you say. It's something that you use to create the world in which your characters live. And it has to rock with the waves. It has to the wind has to blow there. It has to have smells and stuff. And your real task as a writer is how to create that setting without going on and on and on about it. You know, just a, a few details. It's about, you know, the best way to talk about setting is talking about William Gibson. Do people know Neuromancer? The sky was the color of a TV tuned to a dead channel. That's from Neuromancer. That's the opening line of Neuromancer. It sets the tone for the whole book. What does it say? It's the modern world. It's, it's a world in which nature is compared to technology instead of the other way around. Everything has, technology is now more powerful than nature. So we don't compare things to nature like in Homer, we compare nature to things. And it's, it has a certain dystopian quality to it. It's gray. It, he, he sets a whole tone there, and it's all with setting, because Gibson is all setting. Gibson, to me, is an art director. His characters, really the characters in Neuromancer in the plot, is just the Wizard of Oz, you know? It, not to knock it, I mean, it's a, it's a great book, but the strength of it is the setting, the art direction. You walk in a room, and there'll be, you'll see two things in the room, and they're both things that'll tell you 
I wish I had the book here. I could open to any page. There, there are things that will reveal a whole society by what's sitting on a table. They walk down the street and you'll see three things. Those three things will tell you the class structure, the technological level, and the, the mood of a whole city. Take my word for it because I haven't got the book to read from. But people read the book and they know what I'm talking about. Gibson is Gibson's good at details. But they're not just details in general, they're details about setting more than about character. The point of this whole monologue being that you're that the the setting is not something you say, it's something you create, it's something you create out of objects, and it's something that you it's it's art direction. You carefully place things around or you carefully notice things in such a way that it illuminates a whole city, a whole culture. And that's what setting can do if it's handled right. It has to be the window in which you enter the world and it has to be a world with enough reality that your characters can interact with it and bounce off of it and convince the reader that it's real. The text of this recording is copyright 1999 by Terry Bisson. The sound recording is copyright 2007 by Odyssey Writing Workshops.